the next few weeks, we are going to begin to walk into a brand new series. We are very simply calling values. This is going to be a little bit of a transitional week between Jesus said what and diving into, as a church, we have some core values that we've defined over the last two or three years and even adjusted a little bit over the last few months. We haven't adjusted our values in a negative way. We have expanded them in a more specific way. Values, and this is all I'm going to say about this because I can't spend too much time here, Values are essential, okay? What you value will determine the atmosphere that you create wherever you go. Values are what cause culture to be created. Look at our nation right now. Values, culture. There's a direct correlation between the unspoken atmosphere of your home, the unspoken atmosphere of your office, the unspoken atmosphere of your vehicle, (laughs) the unspoken atmosphere of our state and our nation. That's culture. And the thing that determines culture are values. So values are essential. Hear me. If you don't have the right values, then you are really vulnerable. It's important because the lower our values are, the higher our vulnerability is. Going to define that a little bit more over the next few weeks. This morning, I want to take some time in this transition to define some terms. I think there's some very specific terms that we need to define. Listen, I'm, hear me. I'm not defining terms for the world today, okay? I am defining, this is not, we are not in Washington, D.C. We are not in Baton Rouge, okay? There may be some people watching from some of those areas. It could have an impact on a few people who may have an impact on those areas. I am defining terms. This is very important. I am defining terms today for this worship center. I am defining terms for New Hope Church or New Hope Fellowship Incorporated because that is the platform for which I have influence. And so it's very important that we are defining terms. Why? Because if you don't define terms, you can't have discussions. Or you may be having a discussion and somebody else is having a discussion and you are trying to have a discussion together but you're causing division because you're not defining terms the same way. For example, maybe this never happens to you, but um, I, I have this person I spend a lot of time with. We have a lot of conversations. We have a lot of discussions. And we don't always define terms in the same way. She's about five foot two <laughs> with heels on. But she's German feisty, y'all. I mean, she looks sweet between the hours of 9 and 9. But y'all don't know her before and after 9 and 9, I'm telling you. Okay? There are times where we have discussions and we are defining terms differently. And instead of our discussions causing us to be more diverse and more dynamic, it actually causes division. For instance, one time we were having a conversation. This was just uh, several years ago. It was when we first got here. Actually, and I realized this morning, this is our five-year, like, voted-in preaching anniversary. Yeah, thanks. That's cool. That's cool. We had 93 people voted on us when we moved here. 93 people voted. Six people voted against us. Uh, They have since either left or realized they were wrong. And so here we are. (laughs) I'm supposed to only share that in next steps if my wife is shaking her head. I can feel her through the camera right now shaking her head at me. So we were having a conversation, and my, my wife, we were having a conversation about accountability, and she was saying one thing, and then I said I said the wrong thing. What, that's not what I meant when I said it, but I, what I said was not what she wanted. And so we have this rule when we're having a conversation. Just, this is communication 101. This is healthy for every relationship, friendships, marriage specifically. If you will repeat back to the person what you thought they said, 
It's actually a very helpful tool. I'm so grateful we had this tool because when I said, and I can't even remember what it was, or I'd tell you because it'd be funny at, at this point. When I said whatever it was that I said, she said, are you saying, and I was like, no, no, that is not what I'm saying. It was very important that in that moment, we took the time to define terms. I want to preach a message today called Awake or Woke. I believe if the enemy, hear me, you remember that story about the, the tower that the people of the Old Testament wanted to build up into heaven? And the Bible says that God had to confuse their language because when they united themselves together, there was nothing that they couldn't accomplish. And so God had to confuse their language in that moment. It's called the Tower of Babel. I think the enemy took notes on that day. And now he has taken even the English language and began to cause confusion in our communication because the enemy, the devil, which is who our battle is against, always, the I'll get back to it. The devil, the enemy, knows that if he can confuse us, he can constrict us. And if he constricts our communication, then it could confound our calling and what we can accomplish for the kingdom of God. Listen, if you know me, you know that I'm, uh, I'm never afraid to tackle tough topics. Um, sometimes I'm a little too excited to do so, in fact, uh, but I do always care how something makes somebody feel, okay? So today, I want you to understand that I've, I've prepared for this message with more hours and conversations and study and reading and prayer, discernment, than I probably have any other message recently. Not that I don't put a lot into that. I, I probably have about 20 hours of preparation. That's on the low end into this one message. I can't do that every week um, for everything. And thank God for some things, they come to me a little bit easier. This one was hard, okay? This was difficult. And by the way, moving forward and defining these terms will be difficult as well. The Oxford English Dictionary, this is not a new thing. They added this word, woke, to their dictionary in 2017, believe it or not. We just weren't paying attention. Woke, originally an adjective that meant well-informed or up-to-date. Well, that doesn't sound that bad. Well-informed or up-to-date. Alert to racial. This is the now, chiefly, according to Oxford English Dic Dictionary, it means now, chiefly, alert to racial and social discrimination and injustice. That doesn't sound that bad frequently in stay woke. It's now become like this phrase or this mantra that a lot of people relate to and a lot of people rebel against, okay? And remember, we're having a conversation today. So take a deep breath. I'm just reading you definitions and some of you are already ready to stand up and say things. I can feel you. Someone will tell you to sit down, and it won't just be me. <laughs> Woke. Uh, I don't reference this often. This is not like a scholarly source per se, but it, it is helpful in seeing at least what some other people think. According to Wikipedia, woke is a term originating in the United States, shocking, that originally referred, originally, hear me, again, this confirms what Oxford English Dictionary wrote, originally referred to awareness about racial prejudice and discrimination, which we've had conversations about, and we will continue to have conversations about. Dr. King said that Sunday morning at 11 o'clock was the most segregated time uh, in, uh, in all of America. And, and, and I love, I, I, I'll just, I won't say names, but just recently on the platform, I didn't ask permission. It was a Wednesday night and we were talking about worship and what worship looks like. And, and one of our panelists said, you know, when we get to heaven, we're not going to get to choose our neighborhood. Put that wherever you want to. <laughs> like it was like, uh, hey God, if you could not put me around any of the Asians... 
that would be that would be great. Like I'm still kind of tore up about that whole that whole thing that happened back at Pearl Harbor. Like I'm angry, man. And so if you could not put me, God will put you in a room full of people you don't like. Get along now or spend eternity with somebody. It's 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 your choice. Woke, woke, racial prejudice. A miracle happened in the 1990s. It's called the Promise Keepers Meeting. It led to another miracle within even our own movement. It was when white and black pastors realized that we could no, be, no longer be satisfied with segregation and call it eternity or call it kingdom. I found a magazine in my office Actually, it wasn't in my office. It was in some boxes my parents had packed up and, and brought me because they're getting their things together to sell their house. And we just sold our house, praise Jesus. And, and so we're, we, we've got all this stuff, right? And, and Megan, she doesn't really care to go through stuff. She's kind of like, boop, 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 boop. And I'm like, well, I, I, you know, we're defining terms. That's important. She's like, you and your nostalgia. Okay, so anyways, I had this magazine, and it's signed by Dr. Bill... Uh, Macaulay, I believe is how you pronounce his last name, McCartney, McCartney, sorry, McCartney. And he was like the head, one of the heads of this Promise Keepers movement. And it, it just resonated with, it reminded me that if we're not intentionally integrated, like in every aspect of our lives, as God's people, we, you understand we all have one daddy, Right? If we're not intentionally integrated, then we will remain unintentionally segregated. The definition on Wikipedia continues, subsequently, this word woke came to encompass an awareness of other issues of social inequality. For instance, regarding gender and sexual orientation. Now I'm concerned. Since the late 2010s, it has also been used as a general term for political movements and perspectives which emphasize the identity of politics for people of color, which is great. We've addressed that. We've talked about that. You can go back to our series last year called Toxicity. We had some very serious conversations about the demon of racism and prejudice that was allowed to exist in the house of God. By the way, what you allow, you approve. If you allow it, it means you're approving it. And when, when, when God's people allow things that we know God doesn't approve, then we begin to subsequently be relieved of our anointing. For instance, I cannot approve an unbiblical relationship. No matter how many people I want to accept and no matter how many people I want to minister to, it doesn't mean that I'm intolerant and angry because I don't approve of an unbiblical lifestyle. I can't. Because if, if I approve it or if I allow it, it means I'm approving it. If I allow my children to be exposed to it, I'm telling my children, hey, this is okay with me. And I want them to be able to designate the difference between people's preferences and God's principles. All of a sudden, transgender rights are in the same conversation with women and minorities. How did that happen? Why is it so important that we define these terms? Because if the enemy can confuse our language, he can constrict our purpose. And we live in a culture and a society that can't look at an individual and say, male. And look at another individual and say, female. We are ignoring biology for the sake of individual rights. And then calling that an extreme or extended version of a word that originally just meant awareness of injustice. Dr. Noel Maring in her new book, Awake Not Woke, which is where we had originally borrowed the title, 
And we decided to change it because we're not trying to be intentionally offensive today. Dr. Maring, in her book, defines the term in this manner. It's right in the introduction. She says, this is the state of being alert and attuned to layers of pervasive oppression in society. By the way, there are layers of pervasive oppression in every society, every civilization, every, every class or group or, or, or individual groups of people. Unintentionally, it's human nature to oppress people that aren't like you or to exclude people that you don't like based on their social, economic, ethnic, whatever background. If it's not like you, then you don't intentionally include them. That's why if you go to most churches, you look around and most of the people in the room, they kind of look like one another. They kind of talk like one another. They may even smell like one another. And people could walk into a body of believers. How could you walk into the body of Christ and feel excluded? Because it is people's natural propensity to be exclusive with people that are like them. It's a natural tendency to oppress. It's a natural tendency to exclude Dr. Noel Maring says this, while it originated specifically with regard to racism, it has since broadened to include all areas of social oppression commonly considered to be along the lines of gender, race, and sexuality. It's very important that we take the time to define these terms. Here's what I'm not saying by this title today. I'm not saying that anybody that uses this language awake or woke or whatever is going straight to hell. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not even saying that they're evil. What I am saying is that we need to take the time to stop and discern what they mean by the terms that you're, they're using. Wait, are you saying da 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 And now we can have a conversation. But if we just hear the word and we jump to conclusions, then we miss the opportunity to have conversations with people that not only we could have had relationship, but maybe God could have used us to have relationship through. I'm saying that we need to stop and we need to weigh what someone may mean by what they say, not just hear what they say. And then we need to take that and we need to compare it to what God has already said. Remember, we're called to be biblical before we're called to be political. We were Christians before we were Americans. God has called us and he wants to use us. I don't mean by addressing this today to throw a gospel blanket on a fire of prejudice. That's not what I'm saying at all. And call it smothered or call it cleansed. And then my, my children or my children's children continue to trip over the same lump that I've just been throwing a gospel blanket on top of. Because we're not justified by faith alone. We're saved by grace through faith. But faith without works is dead. You can't exclude one. This is not an either or conversation. It's a both and. I'm not saying that we should be ignoring someone who has a painful past experience because they are a minority. I would believe actually that we should listen to that experience. We should be considerate of that experience. If someone had a painful experience in any other area, we would listen to them. If something happened to them because of the way that they were raised or where they were raised, if they came in from Istanbul and something had taken place in their lives, we would listen to them and we would have empathy, even sympathy for them. But all of a sudden, in regards to race and injustice, we go, that's over and dealt with. No, it's not. We're still dealing with it. I'm not saying that we should be inconsiderate and ugly to one another. I'm saying the opposite I am concerned, however, hear my heart today, that something that began as a mantra has become an organization. And you can look this up for yourself, but that organization, this is concerning, 
has set out to, and I quote, free us from the tight grip of heteronormative thinking. That's concerning. Heteronormative thinking. That just means male and female in oneness. This organization is committed to disrupting the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement. That's concerning. There are those who we used to consider suffering from gender dysphoria that are trying to grab onto the coattails of the social justice movement. And now people who are choosing to affiliate with a certain so-called demographic of other people are getting in the way of what God and the church have been wanting to do since at least the 90s and should have been wanting to do it earlier than that. Just a few weeks ago, gospel artist Matthew S. felt a need to apologize. I don't know if you saw this or not. This drove me crazy. Like, I almost made 17 Facebook videos about this. But I'm very careful not to speak when I'm angry, but to study and show myself approved. Why? Because if you don't learn in this generation, you will get left behind. And so I stopped to study and listen and and discern what God had to say. But I saw that gospel artist Matthew West, just a few weeks ago, he made a, a satirical song. It was satire. It was funny. The song was called Modest is Hottest. Can I get an amen from a daddy in the room today? Can I get an amen from a mama who's trying to raise a man of integrity in a society of sexualization in the house today? This was a fun attempt, and I quote Matthew West, a fun attempt to remind his daughters that their identity is not in their appearance. Their identity is not in their appearance. So in the video, he has them in a turtleneck and long khaki pants which is the appropriate dress for all daughters of the Lord. I'm just, (laughs) hey, by the way, it doesn't mean the guys get to wear and do whatever they want to either. Saw a boy walking through Walmart yesterday, had a shirt on. It was cut down to here. I was like, what is the purpose of that? Boy, I see all your lines. And it wasn't like defined lines. They were just kind of (laughs) lines. Put some clothes on, son. Ain't nobody want to see if you are working, if you're at the beach, like appropriate dress for appropriate places. But we don't care about professionalism. We don't care about our appearance. We just care about our individual feelings and rights. And so in a fun attempt, what 20 years ago, every dad in America would say openly and happily became a viral attack against women. In a moment. And he had to take it down and apologize. Well, he kind of apologized. It was a little bit, (laughs) it was a little bit like I would have apologized. It was semi-honory. He was accused of misogyny, which is prejudice against women. He was accused of, of policing women's bodies. One Christian artist, by the way, said women should be able to wear what they want and not be concerned about perverted men not being able to see bare skin. Christian artists. So here's where I became concerned. When this terminology began to seep into Christianity and it caused us to lower our standards of morality. Because I know that the lower the morality the higher the mortality. See, it's important that we take the time to stop. And let me just, by the way, as I read my first scripture today, state for the record that I will be known for policing the bodies of at least three specific women. They will walk out of the house and they will not be dressed to... uh, provoke unhealthy attention from another woman and or another guy or in this culture god help us like freudian slip right and and also and also by the way if they happen to have a tank top on that shows their shoulders and some boy sees it i will also be known for helping young men maintain their integrity 
around my daughter and around my baby. And my wife will be known for making sure that my son and I become and remain as men in integrity in a society that is saturated with sexualization. Everything doesn't just go. Ephesians 5.10. Ephesians 5.10. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. This is so important. Paul, look, by the way, America, we're on our way. We're well on our way. But American culture has still not eclipsed Roman culture. You go back and read some of Roman history and the Greco-Roman culture, pre-Christianity. I don't have time to preach all that today. But in that culture, Paul write, writes to the church of Ephesus. I believe this is a stance for new hope. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Before you make that video, before you get on TikTok, before you send that DM, which could also be translated as dirty message. All the young kids are like, that's not what that means. <laughs> Some of y'all are using it for that. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Are we listening more to what we see on social media than we are what we read in Scripture about how we should treat one another? Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Verse 14 Jumping down, for the light makes everything visible. This is why it is said, awake, awake, O oh, sleeper. Remember, he's writing to the church, not the world. This is not a finger pointing. This is a calling. Awake and rise up from the dead and Christ will give you light. Verse 15, so be careful how you live. Don't live like fools. But like those who are wise, let me say it this way, don't respond like fools, don't act like fools, don't parrot and or mock like fools. We, we're called to be part of the solution, not to add to the segregation. We're, we're called to be part of the answer, not add to the issues. So, so be wise. Don't, don't post like fools. Don't video like fools. Don't dress like fools. Don't talk like fools. Put whatever you want to right there. But like those who are wise. Verse 16, and then make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Make the most of it. Yes, the days are getting worse. You know what that means? There's a lot of souls to win. Come on, somebody. This is the greatest opportunity the gospel's ever had in the history of the gospel because there are billions upon billions of people right now wondering if anybody cares. The empty seats around you in this worship center, they represent someone within a 15-mile radius that's sitting alone in their home today wondering if God is listening. And they walked past you this week, but we were too focused on what we wanted than what God had. And we missed them. Because we weren't making the most of every opportunity in these evil days. We are joining in with the already evil rhetoric. And we're just as frustrated and unfulfilled as unbelievers. Verse 17. Don't act thoughtlessly. Don't act thoughtlessly. But understand what the Lord wants you to do. Let me give you three things this morning. Three things. Number one, if you're taking notes, I want to invite you to suspend judgment. My wife did this for me, praise God. My wife did this for me in conversation. When I used the wrong word. When we were defining words differently. Suspend judgment. Let's make it fun. Write this down. Never lump, never jump. Never lump an individual into an entire group of people just because they use one word that may affiliate with the group. Never lump an individual that doesn't vote like you. Well, you know what? I made, a, I made a mistake, Pastor, in this church. I'm going to confess now. 
I moved here in 2016. It was August of 2016. I preached on July 28th. I'll never forget the date. Became a lead pastor, overwhelmed by life already. Here we go. We're going to take a church. <laughs> what are we doing? Okay, so here we go. We got here. And then three months later, we had an election. Okay, that's okay. Four years later, we had another election. You know what I didn't do? I didn't prepare the church for what was going to happen on the way to the next election. And the election of 2020 caused division within this house. Because we listen more to Fox News, CNN, NBC, Newsmax, social media, or our favorite spokesperson and political right winger or left winger than we are the word of God. And I refuse to let that happen again in 2024. We need to, number one, suspend judgment. We don't need to lump people in to an enlarged category, two political parties could never represent 40 million people. There are discrepancies within those parties. And by the way, there are communists in China who love Jesus, but it's all they know. And they think communism is the answer for politics, but they know Jesus is the answer for eternity. It's all they've ever been taught. We can't lump individuals in just because they don't agree with us on one issue and they decide not to vote for somebody that you think that they should vote for. Can't do it. We can also never jump to conclusions. Never jump to conclusions. Hearing one side of the story, you cannot, you cannot give a fair assessment of the entire story. You have to take accounts from both sides. I made a dire mistake as a youth pastor. Somebody came to me and said, Pastor, so-and-so said, -da 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 -da, and this happened, and this happened. And I went immediately to that person, and I gave correction. The problem was I didn't listen to that person's side of the story. And I wounded them because I did not give them an opportunity to express from their perspective what actually happened. Take this perspective and this perspective and put the actual story together so that I could sit both of them down and have a biblical conversation. I lumped them in. There's a story in Joshua chapter 22. Don't have time to read it. It's a story about the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half a tribe of Manasseh. You may or may not remember, but in the book of Exodus, the Reubenites and the Gadites and half the tribe of Manasseh, and from this point forward, I'm just going to say Reubenites, because that's a lot, okay? I could say RGM, but I don't want to be, like, confusing today, so I'll just say Reubenites. Before they went over into the promised land, they were on the east side of the Jordan with Moses and the Reubenites and the other tribes, asked Moses if they could inherit this portion of land east of the Jordan, and Moses said, yes, this land can be attributed to you. You can inherit this portion of the land, but you have to go over with your brethren. You have to come over with the Israelites, and you have to fight God's battle with God's people. So they crossed the Jordan, and you read throughout the book of Joshua that they did just that. They fought. They fought expecting nothing in return. And then they went back home. At the end of all the battles, after they had helped the Israelites overcome the promised land, they began to go back home. But before they crossed the Jordan, they built an altar. And the Israelites assumed automatically, because they had seen altars like this before. They had seen language like this before. They had heard stories like this before. They had a past, and they remembered what happened last time. And so when the Reubenites built this giant altar, the Israelites thought, the Reubenites are rebelling against God and about to offer unholy sacrifices. Let's go to war and kill them. That's a true story. You can go read it. And the Israelites mount up for war and go down to the Reubenites, the Gadonites, and half a tribe of Manasseh. And they're like, we're going to slay you in the name of the Lord, you reprobates. And the Reubenites are like, Whoa, What? You built the altar. We're like, whoa, that's not an altar. That's a monument. It just looked like something that you had seen before. But it's not at all what I meant to say. This is just a mantra. I can't help that an organization took the mantra and made it something I never intended it to be. They built the altar and the Reubenites confessed to the Israelites, the reason we built that is because we wanted our ancestry, we wanted the next generation to know that just because we're on the east side of the Jordan doesn't mean that we don't serve the God of Israel. 
We wanted it to be a monument, a reminder. Have you ever gone to war with somebody on Facebook because you jumped to conclusions? Have you ever gone to war with somebody that you were supposed to love and lead because you jumped to conclusions? I'm telling you, in this time and age, we've got to suspend judgment. Dr. Bruce Coates, he taught me one of my first graduate courses. He's one of my first introductions to School of Urban Missions, or SUM as it's called now, which we now host for Bible college students and people who feel called to ministry. He said this, the only way to become judgmental is if we forget how fallen we were before Jesus. That's what makes us judgmental. It's what makes us arrogant. When we forget how fallen we were before Jesus, then we become judgmental towards people who are not like us. And by the way, that's a Pharisee. And Jesus dealt harshly with that. Number two, not only should we suspend judgment, I believe we should stay sensitive. Oh, hey, by the way, I can say that without being soft on sin. You better believe it. If not, we can have a conversation in my living room while nobody's listening, except for the government who will be listening through my phone. (laughs) Stay sensitive without being soft on sin. This is not an either or conversation. This is not a black oppression or a white privilege conversation. Stop getting stuck in what the world is saying. This is not a you're a prejudiced and you're racist because you're this color and you're that color or you came from here. Listen to one another. If somebody had a bad experience because of their upbringing, then listen to them. We do that in every other aspect. Why would we not do it based on the melanin or lack thereof in our skin? What happened? What happened is just just being sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the people that he puts in our path. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 3, Paul writing to the church in Philippi, from prison, by the way. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. Nothing. In other words, do it in humility and count others more significant than yourselves. Verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interest of others. Guys, this is not a recommendation for the church in Philippi. This is a requirement for godly living. And we can't forget this when we see something that offends us. Especially from somebody we know. We have to remember, oh, wait, wait. <laughs> oh. Oh, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Shun the la 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 bus. But in everything, with humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Don't look at your own interest. Come on, we are, we are some interest-driven individuals. If anything offends our individual interest, then we act like just like somebody ain't never heard the name of Jesus. I just went North Louisiana country on y'all. Verse 5. Oh, this is, oh, wow, what? Why don't you just read that one for yourself? This is how you shouldn't act. This is who you should act like. I'm going to skip this next part for the sake of time. It's in your notes. In verse 2, I define a term according to the original Greek. I want you to hear hear me. Hear my heart. An insensitive, angry right-winger an intolerant individualist left winger they want to tell God's people that you have to choose it's this or this and they want to try to define political entities want to try to define terms that God has already defined I believe the enemy wants us to think this is an either or conversation God is love 
and you should be tolerant and accepting of all. Oh, God is just. Well, is he love or is he just? Yes. Yes, he is. Well, Jesus told the truth. No, Jesus was full of grace. And he was just gentle, Jesus. Except for that time he built a whip and hit people with it and drove them out of his father's house. But outside of that, he was a gentle Jesus. And the time he told that guy he's going to be thrown off with those who committed atrocities in the place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But outside of that, he's a gentle. <laughs> he's full of grace. Okay, hang on. And truth. Well, don't you want me people to tell? What do you do? I need to tell people the truth. Yeah. Yeah, people need to know the truth. It's not a favor for you to lie to somebody. I agree with that. But the way you do it is just as important as what you do. Because if you remove justice from love, it's not God. If you remove love from justice, it's not God. You remember the young African-American male that ran across the courtroom and hugged the young woman who had obviously made a mistake and needed to pay or was subject to payment. And the whole world got to see what Jesus looked like. That's not what we celebrated. Grace and truth. If you remove grace from the conversation of truth, you don't have Jesus. If you remove truth from the conversation of grace, you don't have Jesus. Because he was both. This is my final point. I want to encourage you to seek God's spirit. Seek God's spirit. For the sake of time, I want to jump down to Acts 27 verse 11. Acts 27 verse 11, if you'll jump with me. Paul is on a ship. He has been placed under the guard of a centurion soldier. The centurion soldier is directly responsible for the prisoners on that ship, and one of them is the Apostle Paul. They're about to head into the storm. It had been a little bit of a difficult journey already, and the Apostle Paul stands up and gives a warning. Hey, if we don't anchor down right now, by the way, this is from a really good series by Pastor, Pastor Michael Todd called Anchored. I highly recommend the series. Not going to re-preach his sermon I just caught this and I had to share it with you. Verse 11 says, But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship. In other words, the centurion, the person who was placed in authority, hashtag bride of Christ. Remember the servant? You remember the master gave responsibility to the servant and said, hey, hey, until I return, you're in charge. So the person who is in charge, hear me, listen more to the earthly authority than to the heavenly authority. The centurion paid more attention to who he thought was in charge or who he wanted to be in charge than who was actually in charge. And they suffered a great loss. Who are you paying more attention to? Culture or kingdom? Because one of them will affect how you feel about other people and even God himself. So I asked the question, am I awake? Or woke. It doesn't mean that I'm ready to slap somebody that doesn't agree with me. It means I need to be educated enough to have an anointed conversation with people who aren't like me. Luke chapter 21. What's the difference? This is the final passage. I'm going to pray over you. Because I, hey, because I can sense right now that there's, there are some people in this room who the Holy Spirit is stirring in. And I want to invite you to listen to the Holy Spirit. Our battle is not Republican versus Democrat. Our battle is heaven versus hell. 
Our battle is not black versus white. Our battle is against powers and principalities of darkness who are attempting to demolish the divine. That's where our battle is. In Luke 21, Jesus talking about the last days. He says this in verse 31. So also, when you see these things taking place, you can go read those things. You know that the kingdom of God is near. Jesus, 2,000 years ago, came preaching the simplest sermon that's ever been preached. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. If the kingdom was at hand 2,000 years ago, then where do you think it is today? And Jesus said, the kingdom of God is near. Verse 32, truly I say to you, this generation, the generation, what generation? The generation that sees everything that Jesus just said. This generation will not pass away until all has taken place. Verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. So you need to be listening more to my words than you do anything or anybody else in this world. Verse 34, but watch out. Watch out. Because in the last days, your hearts will be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness. Oh, do not assume that Jesus is just talking about drunkenness on alcohol. Because I'm watching a generation full of people get drunk on all kinds of stuff. They get drunk on movies. They get drunk on music. They get drunk on entertainment. They get drunk on affection. They get drunk on approval. They get drunk on attention. They get drunk on political platforms. And they forget that the Great Commission was not a recommendation. It was one of the last and most important things that Jesus said. And so Jesus said, hey, you better watch out. Because your hearts are going to be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and all kind of cares of this temporary life. And the day of my return will come upon you suddenly like a trap. And we're off. Verse 35. For it will come upon all who dwell on the face of the whole earth. But, But verse 36. And this is where I wanted, this is why I wanted to preach this message. But stay awake. Come on, church, stay awake at all times, praying that you may have strength to escape, to escape all these things that are going to take place. (laughs) I just can't believe the direction. Have you read this? (laughs) All these things that... Because why? Because you weren't created to just stand here. Isn't it interesting that Jesus spent more time walking with people than he did preaching from platforms? Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't just stand firm on the topics. He stood in the gap for the people. Like the lowest of the low. And at the end of the day, as anxious as I was about preaching this message, I just want to stand with Jesus. So the greatest question that you can ask yourself has nothing to do with awake or woke or how we define terms in the English language. The greatest question that you have to ask is, is I'm standing. Am I standing with Jesus would you bow your head and close your eyes Father I pray that you would move God right now blow through this room like the wind and show us any area of our lives that doesn't represent you show us any area of our lives that we need to adjust and not just call it redeemed because we covered it with faith but God may we work on this Because you you make ministry messy and discipleship dirty, but it's worth it to work on it. God, I pray for anybody in this room right now or anybody watching online who is not standing with you. They're not in relationship with you. 
It's the first and foremost place and position that we should be. And you make it very simple. You said, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We can stand with you with one profession. So right now, if that's you and you're not standing with Jesus or you haven't been standing with Jesus or you need to commit or recommit your life, I want to invite you to open your hands right where you are. I don't want to belabor it. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now, right now, to surrender your life fully to Jesus. If you're confident of who you are in Christ this morning, I want to invite you to pray with anybody that needs to make this confession of faith today. I want to ask everybody to pray loud so that anybody that needs to pray this prayer would be willing to pray out loud and know that they're not alone. Because when it comes to the gospel, you get to be included. Let's pray this prayer together. Jesus, forgive me where I've fallen short, where I've been distracted, disobedient. I believe you want me to be awake for your return and the people in my life. You gave your life so I could live. So take my life and make it yours. Use me for your kingdom. You shed your blood, you died on the cross so I could be saved. You were raised from the dead so I could be born again and made new to be used for your kingdom. May I follow you with all of my heart with all of my heart, in every area of my life, from this day forward, in Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can you give God praise today? Hey, walk out of here awake this morning. I wanna invite you, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time in a long time, please let us know. You can take the time to text us, I believe, 84576, before people gather their things, okay, this is really important. This is kingdom principle important right here. If that's you, please let us know. We want to follow up with you.